sets out in the Starship. Now, history in the Middle Ages with a look at castles. When you think of the Middle Ages, what comes to mind first? Castles full of knights, the great cathedrals and churches, half-timbered houses, perhaps. We still use the churches and cathedrals today, and old houses make modern homes. But we don't use castles anymore, at least not in the way they were originally used. Huge buildings like this took years to build, and they cost the earth, even then. Why did the people of the Middle Ages build them? The Normans built the first proper castles after the invasion of 1066. They needed bases from where they could patrol the countryside and strongholds to protect themselves from Saxon attack. These strongholds were also their homes. The castles had to be built in a hurry, so they were made of timber and placed on top of an earth mound called a mot, with a courtyard below known as a bailey. Two years after the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror built a mot and bailey castle here at Warwick. That's all that remains of that early castle, the mot. The Bayeux Tapestry shows us the big disadvantage of those early castles. Attackers could easily set fire to the wooden palisades and buildings. So the castle builders began to use stone instead. The first thing was to build a stone wall around the bailey in place of the wooden palisades. And then to build another stone wall on top of the mot. This was called a shell keep. But the earth on top of the mot often couldn't take the weight of a strong tower. So they built a keep in the bailey instead. And for added safety, the entrance to this was at first floor level up a flight of steps. It wasn't very comfortable living in the keep. So eventually the lords moved out into proper houses in the bailey. This meant that they weren't so well protected. So the walls had to be strengthened even more. Of course, the weakest part of any castle was the entrance. You needed a really strong gatehouse and even an outer gate or barbican. Edward I added an extra ring of walls around his castles, always lower in height than the inner walls. Round the whole thing, there was often a moat. Of course, many castles couldn't have a water-filled moat because they were too high up like at Warwick, where the River Avon was too far below the castle to fill the moat. So another solution had to be found. This dry moat, or rather this ditch, isn't nearly as deep as it used to be. But then it must have been a major obstacle for any would-be attacker. And rightly so, because when it came to warfare, the man who dug this ditch and redesigned much of Warwick Castle was a real professional. The 11th Earl of Warwick, Thomas Beecham was a famous knight. He commanded part of the army at the battles of Cressy in 1346 and Poitiers, ten years later. Two of the greatest English victories in the Hundred Years' War. Just look at Thomas Beecham's handiwork. Imagine trying to capture that lot. Thomas had obviously picked up a lot of ideas about castle defence when he was fighting in France. Strong castles had high walls. You'd need a very long ladder to climb this wall and it wouldn't do you much good either because along the top of the wall ran the wall walk. This enabled defenders, and often there weren't very many of them, to quickly dash to any trouble spot. Wooden shutters across these gaps, known as embrasures, protected you from enemy fire. Yeah. 
If you think the walls are daunting, look at this tower. If the enemy captured your curtain wall, you could still shoot them from up here or from any of the other towers around. From this loophole, you could shoot sideways and downwards and so protect the foot of the castle wall. Ah! Now let's take a look at this tower. It's even more elaborate. It's got an extra bit on the top, which was the guard room. It's a bit dangerous up here because of these gaps in the floor. They're called machicolations, and you use them for dropping stones or for pouring nasty liquids like boiling pitch or quicklime onto the attackers beneath. Now let's imagine that we're attacking the castle. The way in is protected by a gatehouse with a barbican in front of it providing an extra layer of defence. If we brave the arrows, we're confronted by a drawbridge and a portcullis. If we manage to fight our way through those, we then enter this area, affectionately known as the killing ground. Under fire from every side and even from above. This is proving a real headache. And still, there's another gate, another portcullis to get through, for I'm in the castle. Not doing very well at capturing this castle. What else can we do? Well, we could use this battering ram to hammer away at the base of the walls. Or we could hurl large boulders at them using this mangonel or catapult. The trouble is, it's worked by a series of twisted ropes, and these can be affected by the damp. It's not that accurate. Better still, let's use this trebuchet. It's much more powerful. And we'll use it to hurl the bodies of dead animals over the top of the battlements. On landing, the bodies will burst apart and splatter the inside of the castle, causing disease to spread. There's nothing new about germ warfare. The best way of getting in is to dig a tunnel under the walls fill it with brushwood and set fire to it. The fire will burn away the roof supports. The roof will cave in and down will come the castle wall above. Luckily for us, there's no water-filled moat around Warwick Castle, so we won't have to drain it before we start digging. Mind you, they've been clever with their building. Look at this tower. It's round. If you want to make a building collapse by tunnelling underneath it or by hurling boulders at it with a trebuchet, the best place to start is at the corner. There isn't one. As I said at the beginning, a castle wasn't only a fortress, but a home. A home for the Lord, for his family, and for the people that work there. There might have been hundreds of them. Servants, craftsmen, a priest, a cook, an armourer, a blacksmith. And, of course, a small garrison of knights and archers. And some of these people would have had their families living in the castle as well. Only the most important people had beds, like the constable. This was probably his bedroom. When Earl Thomas went away to visit other castle, he took most of his staff with him. The constable was left behind to look after things while his master was away. Terrific.
Well, this was the constable's chamber, and in his lord's absence, it was the constable who held the court and made sure that the day-to-day -day running of the castle estates ran smoothly. That was very important, because a nobleman's wealth depended largely on the hard work of the peasants on the castle farms. Some of the jobs were ploughing, sowing, harvesting, reaping, and shearing sheep. This was the constable's toilet. It's called the garda robe because people used to hang their robes and clothes up in here. The idea being that the smell will keep the moths away. That's how we get our modern word, wardrobe. Below this seat, if you uh, sent anything down there, it ended up in the castle ditch. And sometimes an enemy would get one of their poor men to uh, wriggle up the toilet shaft. <laughs> enter the castle that way, then he'd go downstairs, open the gates, because nobody would touch him, and let in his friends. Some very famous castles were captured by somebody climbing up the toilet. From one smelly, confined place to another, the prison. The lord of the castle, as the king's representative, often held courts. So prisoners awaiting trial were sometimes locked up down here. But don't imagine that underground rooms like this were always used as prison cells. In fact, they were mostly for food and ammunition. You needed good supplies if you were going to survive a long siege. Actually, the word dungeon comes from the old French donjon and it means a keep, not a prison. It was only after the Middle Ages, when castles like this were no longer lived in by great lords, that sometimes the keep became the local jail. It was then that an unfortunate prisoner may have been confined in this dreadful hole as an extra punishment. And I can tell you, there's scarcely enough room to breathe, let alone move down here. But a medieval lord would never have kept a captured enemy knight in a place like this. Think of the ransom money he'd lose if a knight was left to rot down here. Large ransoms only go to prove just how valuable a knight was in the Middle Ages. A knight on his horse was as powerful as a tank is in today's army. You'd often find a young knight in the castle bailey doing this, riding at the quintain. The idea was to ride up, strike the quintain arm with your lance, and then get out of the way before the sandbag swung round and hit you. Once you'd mastered that, you could take part in the tournament. helped the knight prepare himself for battle. It was also a superb spectator sport. The trouble was that once you put a helmet on your head, no one could tell who you were. So knights began to wear badges on their helmets and shields. We call these badges coats of arms. <sighs> Crikey, mate. Absolutely boiling in this chain mail. This doesn't look heavy, but this is a 
Hallberg, and it weighs an absolute ton. And this is my coif, which absolutely presses the whole of your head down. And it's very, very tight. Knights were very well protected by chainmail, but with the development of better weapons, like the longbow, the knight needed more protection. Earl Thomas's grandson, Richard, was a very famous knight, and by the time he became Earl of Warwick, knights wore plate armour over their chain mail. It wasn't very practical. You couldn't put it on yourself. It was jolly heavy and extremely difficult to move around in. Sometimes there would be as many as 30 different pieces in one suit of armour. but it looked magnificent. A great knight had to look splendid, even in death. Earl Richard's tomb is one of the finest in Britain. Earl Richard died in 1439 and lies here in state. Below him are the small carved figures of mourners to show his importance. Such splendor was all very well, but it had become extremely expensive to be a knight and to own a castle. What's more, by the end of the Middle Ages, many knights didn't want to go on long expeditions with the king. So they paid a fine instead. This money paid for the peasant armed with the longbow, which had now become the decisive force in the English army. The knight had lost his military importance and cannons were improving all the time. At Warwick, Richard III started to build a keep with gun ports to fire cannon in defence. Richard died in 1485, soon after building was begun, and no one ever bothered to finish this keep. Why? Well, because castle defence just didn't matter anymore. In fact, that was true a hundred years earlier, in Earl Thomas's time. England was a much more peaceful place by then, and Earl Thomas just didn't expect to be attacked. Look how thin that wall is. Scarcely any defence against a battering ram. Earl Thomas had seen many impressive castles when he was campaigning in France and he just wanted to copy them. So he built himself a superb place to live. Luxurious, comfortable, and much more of a home than a fortress. The front of the castle is in fact just a spectacular front door. And in the 14th century, it would have been even more exciting to look at. The castle would have had tall turrets and wooden gables painted in bright colors. The high roofs would have had gilded weather vanes and great coats of arms. Even the walls on the outside may have been painted. Gradually, as castles began to lose their military importance, people didn't want to live in them anymore. They just weren't comfortable enough. But some people continued to build spectacular homes like this, not for defensive reasons, just to show off, so a castle like Warwick could continue to provide a home for noblemen. Inside, it was changed to suit new tastes. This was once Earl Thomas's chamber. 
but other castles were allowed to fall into ruin. Their owners found them too expensive to maintain. Stripped of everything that could be used elsewhere, only the shell remains. Zigzag is the last of this afternoon's daytime on two programmes and it begins in a minute.